The World Socialist website is very pleased to welcome historian Joseph Scalise, who delivered a lecture on the betrayals of the Maoist Communist Party of the Philippines on October the 26th. The lecture at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, where Scalise is a postdoctoral researcher, had a broad audience in the Philippines and more widely in Asia and internationally. The day before it was delivered, the CPP's founder, Jose Maria Cizon, viciously attacked Scalise, branding him as a paid CIA agent and accusing him of being a wild informer for the death squads of Pre President Rodrigo Duterte that are murdering activists in the Philippines. Cizon had not a shred of evidence for these slanderous accusations, which were published in a special edition of the CPP's newspaper, Ang Bayan, devoted entirely to the interview. Dr. Scalise's lecture, entitled First a Tragedy, Second a Farce, Marcos Duterte and the Communist Parties of the Philippines, pointed to the parallels between the CPP's assistance to Duterte, whom they now declare is a fascist, to come to power and the support of an earlier prior, uh, uh, another uh, Stalinist party for the Marcos dictatorship. He began his lecture with a detailed documentation refuting Cizon's claim that the CPP had never supported Duterte. Scalise not only established that the CPP had backed Duterte, but explained it was not a political aberration. The betrayals of the CPP flow from the program of Stalinism and Maoism on which it was founded, including the two-stage theory, which relegates the fight for socialism to the distant future, insisting that countries like the Philippines must first proceed through a protracted period of capitalist development. It justifies its support for figures like Duterte as necessary alliances with the progressive national bourgeoisie, a non-existent class. My name is Peter Simmons. I'm the national WSWS editor of the Socialist Equality Party in Australia. And I'm joined in this interview by Tom Peters, a WSWS journalist and a leading member of the Socialist Equality Group in New Zealand. Again, I'd like to welcome you, Dr. Scalise. Could you perhaps begin by telling us something about yourself and why you became engaged in the study of Philippine history? Sure, thank you. Good morning, Peter, Tom. It's a pleasure to be joined with you and uh, to be able to speak to the readers of the World Socialist website. I think every historian has a story why they became a historian. Historians are, I think, inveterate storytellers. Um, we don't spend 10 years in the archive and reading microfilm uh, for nothing. There is a reason why we choose to do this. My story begins in my childhood. Um, my father was a minister. My family uh, was a missionary family. We moved to the Philippines when I was just barely six. It was 1983. Ninoy Aquino had just been assassinated. I grew up in the Philippines uh, and lived for a number of years in the midst of a shanty town. In the process, uh, the Philippines became my home. And while I have pursued a very different career than that that first brought me to the Philippines with my family, uh, that upbringing was the reason why I chose to pursue this course. Uh, I have now spent uh, the majority, a slight majority, but nonetheless, the majority of my life in the Philippines. I identify with the statement of Tom Paine that I am a citizen of the world and humanity is my brethren, but if there is any place in the world where I am most at home, any language where I am most comfortable, any culture that I am most uh, myself, it would be in the city of Manila, it would be in the Philippines, and I think that, that affinity and that deep root in my childhood is why I chose to study the Philippines. The second reason I can summarize much more succinctly, when I became a teenager, I discovered to my horror that the United States had conquered the Philippines in a brutal colonial conquest, something that I had no idea of. A great many people did not know that, uh, either in the Philippines or the United States. And I needed to know why. I needed to know what happened. I needed to be able to account for the immense poverty of my neighbors and of my friends. How had this come about? And I felt the only answer could be drawn from history. Well, I find that very interesting. Um, 
But why in particular the Communist Party of the Philippines? I mean, what, what drew you to that subject in particular? It was, it was a gradual process of narrowing. Um, I think the fact that I was drawn to a history from below, as it were, a history of the oppressed and the marginalized, that was, that was never in question for me. I, mean, I was intending to write some history of Filipino workers or peasants, um, but I came to be aware that one cannot account for all of these struggles, their successes and their failures, and why, despite their self-sacrifice and labor, many of them ended in betrayal or slaughter or nothing or dictatorship. To do that, I had to address myself to the question of the political program that they adopted. To what end were their struggles placed? And that led me inescapably to the question of the Communist Party, which has played a central role in the development of mass struggles in the Philippines over the course of nearly a century. And it was a gradual narrowing down to studying not just the Communist Party, but what the Communist Party wrote, what it told workers and peasants. And that I think was the gradual sort of narrowing of my scholarship to what became my doctoral dissertation. You, you point out in the introduction to your PhD dissertation, I've only read the introduction at this stage, but you, you point out that your approach to this history is different from many others. Others have written in this field, but you explain in your introduction how um, your approach has been different. Perhaps you could expound on this a bit. Yes. Um, I think it's different in two basic regards. There are numerous small differences, and every scholar can point to how their work brings in all of these new details, but I think there are two qualitative differences in my scholarship than previous work. I'd like to say, as someone who has studied this field for a long time, that I gratefully build off of the work of prior scholars. Uh, but I feel that the work of prior scholars has been based largely in the Philippines on interview accounts. Uh, meetings with cadre, ex-cadre leaders, former leaders of the Communist Party, and asking them about the political role that they played. A great deal of valuable material has been acquired as a result, but also I think I demonstrate very clearly a great deal of falsehood has been replicated, precisely because the contemporary written record went unexamined, and thus a leadership that was looking to bury its own past betrayals was able to do so because there was no way to vet whether or not what was being stated in the interview account, if it was accurate other than other interviews. And by studying the contemporary written record and reading it against daily newspapers and so on, I came away with a starkly different account, one that situates the Communist Party at the center of Philippine political life, not at its fringes. And thus my account isn't written so much from the vantage point of the Sierra Madre Mountains, where the NPA has conducted an armed struggle for a great many years, and more from the vantage point of the streets of Manila and the back rooms of Malacanang, the presidential palace. That's the first qualitative difference, I think, is the source material I chose to use. The second has to do more broadly with the study of communism and countries of belated capitalist development. Uh, as you're doubtless aware, as our listeners are doubtless aware, there was throughout the 20th century in the history of the Cold War, a sort of almost industrial mass production of anti-communist literature by right-wing scholars. And a number of liter liberal scholars pushed back and wrote accounts that effectively treated communists as nationalists of a local interest and so on, perhaps adopting the banner of communism, but in the end, it was a secondary matter. And by treating the program of Stalinism, which I outlined, I think, very carefully in my lecture, socialism in one country, a two-stage revolution and the block of four classes, by treating that seriously, we can simultaneously engage with all of the local machinations and uh, program of the party, as well as the fact that it was part of a mass movement globally, that it was both localizing and shaping. And I think it, in some way, deparochializes, if I can coin a phrase, the scholarship on communism in the third world. I find that very interesting. Maybe, maybe I'll give um, Tom uh, an opportunity to jump in here with any questions he has. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Joseph. And, and um, I guess, th you know, that uh, you mentioned in your lecture, um, I believe, you know, some of the difficulties you've had in unearthing this material. 
and um, I wondered if that has something to do with the response to your lecture. Uh, it's been viewed thousands and thousands of times. I mean, I believe you said uh, that uh, at one point you were, you were, you know you were talking about the um, dock workers' strike during the Marco Pagal government that that had been buried in history uh, and. Uh, I, you know, is that part of the reason for this um, uh, response? You know, we've published a number of comments on the website in, in defense of your lecture, and um, it appears to have generated a large amount of enthusiasm in the Philippines and more broadly. I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, first, let me respond to the latter point. I am aware that the World Socialist website has published statements in defense of my scholarship, and more generally, in defense of historical truth and the work of other scholars as well. I think this is admirable, um, and I am, for why, myself, grateful for this. In terms of the response that my scholarship and this lecture in particular received, I think it's multifaceted. On the one hand, I am bringing to light in my work facts that have been buried for decades. And some of those facts point to immense political crimes. The fact that the PKP prepared the ground for, facilitated the rise of, and embraced the Marcos administration, and murdered members of their own cadre who opposed this policy. That entire narrative has been buried for a great many years. And I have brought it to light. And I think that has led to a great deal of interest. Uh, the fact that the CPP was allied to the bourgeois opposition and that the bourgeois opposition was not engaged in the defense of democracy, but was angling to become the dictators themselves. Again, this is, uh, I think, a, a remarkable contribution to our understanding of this period. And again, leads to some of the enthusiasm around the talk. But I think most fundamentally, the reason there was so much interest in this talk is because I was documenting a much more recent development, something that everyone knew but didn't quite have what we call the decibels, the evidence for. Uh, and that is the fact that the Communist Party of the Philippines enthusiastically supported Rodrigo Duterte, facilitated his rise to power, and embraced him when he took office. And they now denounce him as a fascist. It is an extraordinary turnabout. And to bring that to light, to have the temerity to even say it. Everyone's pointed to the courage that was involved, which is a remarkable thing, to point out events that took place during everyone's memory. Somehow requires great courage. Um, and the reason is because you will be attacked. Um, I think this is a key component of why the lecture generated such enthusiasm. Yes, and, and I think also your research in general, I, I believe, your dissertation is being widely read uh, and cited in, in the media and uh, among students. I guess, um, uh, why, why do you think it is, uh, I mean, one of the uh, um, components of your lecture was a response to Jose Maria Cison's attack on you personally and your research, uh, which he hasn't done before as far as I know. I mean, why do you think this uh, vicious reaction at this particular time uh, in the lead up to your lecture. Um, I wonder if you could comment about that. Yeah, um, to be clear, Zison has attacked a number of political figures and even scholars in the past um, and has used a variety of terms that anyone familiar with the way in which he's denounced me should sound familiar, CIA agent, Trotskyite, etc. These are the terms that he levels without any evidence or explanation against a good many people. But there was something qualitatively new in the way in which he attacked me, dedicating an entire issue of the party's flagship publication, Ang Bayan, to this sort of attack rather than a one-off Facebook post. Uh, there was a degree of desperation to the chorus of odium that was being sung by the CPP leadership. And I think that is, demonstrates the fact that there has been an enthusiastic response for my scholarship, my dissertation, has been downloaded 10,000 times, which is quite remarkable. It's been cited in the media, as you mentioned, uh, for a variety of reasons, among different people attempting to ma manipulate it to their own ends, but it is the subject of something of a national conversation. And then it further now touches upon the very sore point that they supported Duterte. And I think the desperation in this current response, Cison could have responded to me over the course of the last three or four years, 
uh, is an expression of the fact that they run the risk of losing a hold over the mass movement. Not simply because of my scholarship, but because there is an awareness that the party was directly responsible for the rise of Duterte, whom they now denounce. And while perhaps a good many young people cannot yet articulate precisely what is an alternative way forward, they sense that this may not be it. And I think Season's attack on me is an attempt to shore up a sense of political leadership. Look, just to um, come to one particular point that um, uh, you've written about and we've written about on the World Socialist website is that you had the extraordinary situation where um, three individuals with connections to the National Democratic um, Movement in the Philippines uh, were on the um, state of, of the CPP appointed to key positions in the Duterte administration. Um, Sison now denies in his interview that this has taken place. I mean, could you comment on this? Yes. First, I would encourage anyone who hasn't done so to actually watch the lecture that I gave. It is available on YouTube. There's a link, I believe, on the World Socialist website as well. And I document in, I feel conflicted about this. I document in substantial detail, and yet I feel I only touched the surface, uh, the fact that they, in fact, supported Duterte. What CSUN is engaged in is what is known politically as a big lie. This isn't a slight falsehood that he hopes he can get away with. He is attempting to bludgeon the population into the belief that what they themselves witnessed never in fact occurred. He asserted that it is an outright lie that the CPP supported Duterte. It's a staggering falsehood on his part. These things were not performed in dark corners. They were performed on a world stage. Sison openly hailed Duterte as the progressive representative of the national bourgeoisie, his choice phrase. He said that Duterte would be the first left or socialist president in the Philippines history. And he went about when Duterte requested cabinet members, selecting certain members in the National Democratic Movement and putting their names forward for inclusion in Duterte's cabinet. And the National Democratic Movement wasn't content simply that they were in the cabinet. Long after they were denouncing Duterte as a fascist, they were still staging protests in the streets demanding that the Senate Committee on App Approvals approve these cabinet members to remain in Duterte's administration. One of them, Joel Magdunsod, remains within the Duterte administration, despite being a member of the Kilusang Mayo Uno, the KMU trade union umbrella. Um, it is truly staggering that Sison thinks he can get away with a lie of this magnitude. I think it demonstrates to a certain extent that he has, over the course of decades, not been called to task from the left. All of the attacks that he has confronted have been of an anti-communist variety, and he could, with a with a certain correctness, simply dismiss these as right-wing attacks by the military and the intelligence apparatus. A left-wing criticism, a criticism that is attempting to defend the vantage point of Filipino workers and peasants, is something that he does not exactly know how to handle, and his recourse is the big lie. Yeah, I mean, it is extraordinary that, that you have uh, members who are connected to the National Democratic Movement, and one of them still in the, in the government. I mean, I think this, just to take up this point, I mean, you have a situation where the CPP has assisted Duterte into the presidency. They now de declare that he is a fascist and openly lie about, about their past and seem, seem to think that they can get away with this complete, with complete impunity. I mean, is, is there a pattern in this behavior? Is this something which has happened before? Um, or is this just a, an aberration? It is by no means an aberration. It is, mm. if I might draw on the title of my lecture, somewhat farcical at this point, the degree of lie that they've resorted to, rather than merely tragic. Um, but it is a pattern. The lies that they have had to engage in, uh, one could go throughout their history. Let me draw simply upon the history that I document in my doctoral dissertation. Joma Sison was responsible for the enthusiastic support supplied by the PKP, of which he was then a leading member, to Josdado Macapagal, uh, endorsing him as carrying out the unfinished revolution of Bonifacio. And among the most enthusiastic lines ever written for any president in Philippine history were written by Joma Sison in 1963. He claimed that there was an uninterrupted line 
of revolutionary continuity between Andres Bonifacio, who fought with great courage and political leadership against Spanish colonialism, through to the Communist Party and the Hook guerrilla movement, to Jostado Macapagat, who was engaged actively in the suppression of workers' struggles across the course of 1963. When the party's ties with Macapagal faltered, Cison instructed the peasant wing, the workers' wing, and the youth wing of the party to support Marcos. As late as late 1967, long after he had broken with the PKP, Joma Cison was still writing friendly letters to Macapagal, or to Marcos, signed, yours very truly, Jose Maria Cison. Again, these things have been lied about so extraordinarily that no one knows this. The party then allied with a liberal party, with Aquino and company, and again, lied about this repeatedly. Now, these lies have been exposed by themselves because while at the time they claimed they were not in an alliance with Aquino, when they then tried to establish ties with Cory Aquino in 1986-87, they drew back upon this history and said, hey, we were in an alliance with your husband back in the day. So there was a certain element of their own self-exposure. But this is a pattern, endorsement, enthusiastic promotion at the progressive section of the national bourgeoisie, and then denunciation as a fascist or a reactionary. They've done this uh, time and again. They did it with uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, assisting her rise to power, and then denouncing her as a fascist when those relations faltered. They assisted Villar. I could go down a long list. The final point I'll make in this regard, that this is not specific to the Philippines. This is the legacy of Stalinism the world over. It is their zigs and zags in an attempt to serve the interests of the bureaucracy in Moscow and Beijing and to establish ties with a section of the capitalist class. Betrayals that they subsequently attempt to bury under the weight of extraordinary lies. Yeah, well, I think that's very true. Um, and I think one of the strong points of, of your lecture um, is that not only do you expose you know, the crimes that have been carried out by Cizon and the CPP. Um, but you explain why they've happened, how it's rooted in their Stalinist um, uh, conceptions um, and the, the, the complete tragedies that this has led to uh, for the Philippine working class and for the working class more broadly in Asia and internationally. I suppose the obvious question is, having denounced Duterte as a as a, as a fascist, is there anyone that they're now seeking to ally with in the Manila establishment? That is, I think, a really important question because it allows me not only to deal with the current vicissitudes of their politics, but also to make a methodological point for, for scholars and to those who are politically aware in the Philippines. And that is this, the CPP and Stalinist parties more generally around the world Function is something of a political bellwether. Their social function is to attempt to achieve an interface between developing social crisis in the working class, the youth and peasantry, a broad mass movement that takes shape in conditions of social crisis such as the present, and the factions of the elite that are squabbling to maintain their hold on power. And in the context of social crisis, invariably, the ideas of authoritarianism begin to come to the fore. And the squabbles intensify as the ruling elite recognize that only one of them will be at the helm of a dictatorship. And so the knives come out. And the function of the CPP is somehow or other, somehow or other, to achieve a link between the mass movement and the squabbling sections of the ruling elite. That makes attentiveness to their political line very, very instructive about political developments in any, in any country where there is a significant Stalinist party. What is the current shift ongoing in the ruling elite in the Philippines? And what is the role of the CPP? Well, in outline form, it's necessary to remind people because they may have forgotten that Rodrigo Duterte was brought to national prominence, not simply by the support of the Stalinists who backed his mayoral role in Davao over the course of years, but also by the Liberal Party. He was part of the Liberal Party apparatus in 2013. Uh, President Noe Noe Aquino attempted to bring him forward as a cabinet member. He was brought to national prominence by the very social forces in the ruling elite that currently are denouncing him. The shift that has occurred in Philippine ruling circles largely centers around the fact that there is an intense social crisis and they are all of them angling for a way to deal with it and suppress it. And at the same time that Duterte, in an attempt to secure loans from China has backed off from the US pivot to Asia. 
And this has deeply upset certain sections of the elite that are more closely tied to Washington. All of them came behind Duterte, nearly to a man, when he took office in 2016. In terms of his own party support, he had but a handful of representatives in the House of Legis in the legislature. And yet, by the time he took office, he had a supermajority, unprecedented in Philippine history, because every faction of the elite and all of their parties were on board with his program. So too was Washington. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry came and gave money for Duterte's war on drugs. But with his shifting alliance towards China and away from the U.S., and with the mounting social crisis, factions have emerged. And the CPP has moved away from Duterte and behind this faction, which above all constellates around Vice President Lenny Robredo, the heir apparent in terms of a constitutional succession that might be carried out, and there are a number of historical precedents for this, by some form of constitutional coup the political establishment and the military, most importantly, withdraw their support. Now this isn't being conducted behind closed doors as far as the CPP is concerned. Joma Sison wrote a statement in February in which he mentioned that he had comrades in the police and the military, rather extraordinary phrase. The head of the Communist Party spoke of his comrades in the police. And he said that what they informed him was what they were quite upset with Duterte, above all because he was no longer in the camp of Washington, but that there would not be the withdrawal of support from the military for Duterte unless they saw a mass movement. CISON has issued statements now to the youth organizations as well, saying a mass movement in the streets will lead to the withdrawal of support by the military. Such a thing would mean only one thing, the insertion of Lenny Robredo as vice president by the military, unless the military chose to take matters into their own hands and establish a junta something they have long angled for at certain points in Philippine history. The CPP is allying with the rival faction of the elite, looking by um, constitutional coup to take power and attempting to channel the mass movement of workers and youth behind such a maneuver. Maybe I'll just jump in here. I mean, it, what you're talking about very much mirrors what we are reporting every day on the World Socialist website in the United States and uh, you know Brazil, uh, countries around the world, this um, uh, you know political crisis within the bourgeois parties uh, and uh, increasingly support for um, authoritarian forms of rule um, and for rule by the military. I guess um, this is all being drastically uh, exacerbated as well by the uh, current crisis triggered by the pandemic. Uh, and uh, I, I wondered how that has played out in the Philippines and in these, um, you know, political uh, crises and uh, maneuvers that you're talking about. Yeah, two points. The first is, I very much agree with the point that you're making about this having global parallels. In my own scholarship, I deal with the 1960s into the 1970s. It is an era of startling political diversity and intensity. But in the background, to the historian who knows what is coming, there is an ominous sense that everything is about to be crushed beneath the heel of authoritarianism. All of the papers stopped publishing in late September. 1972, all of the radio stations are shut down, all of the television networks in the Philippines. But this wasn't an, a Philippine phenomena alone. It followed what occurred in Indonesia with the rise of Suharto, and it was a, a precedent for what occurred in Chile with the rise of Pinochet. There was a rising tide of global authoritarianism. And I think you would have to be blind not to recognize that now. Duterte is a global type. How is this playing out specifically with the COVID-19 pandemic in the Philippines? Well, Duterte is a man with a limited repertoire. He's a populist, right-wing, authoritarian figure, fascistic bent. But his solution to everything is to point a gun at it. Uh, he really knows not much else. Uh, that and to curse and sort of vulgar street Tagalog, which he does quite effectively. And his solution to the pandemic has been to tell everyone, stay in your home or we'll shoot you. That's not an exaggeration, that's a direct quote. Um, and he has repeatedly threatened to turn the military and the police on anyone who had the temerity to leave their home and search for food or employment. 
uh, his solution to the global pandemic is not mass testing, uh, the provision of resources and so on, but a bullet. And this is simply tightening the screws on an already explosive situation. Just as the situation in the United States and elsewhere and Brazil and so on is volatile and untenable and will necessarily produce some sort of a social explosion and we're already witnessing that, so too in the Philippines. Can I, I just take us back to uh, one of the points you were making before about the crisis in the, in the Philippines and that is the extraordinary tensions uh, which are to be found in virtually every capital on the face of the planet, but certainly in Asia, uh, between uh, the US confrontation with, with China, um, you know, the bourgeoisie is compelled into these, these extraordinary balancing acts. Uh, the Philippines has a long history of alliance. It still has an alliance, an alliance with the, uh, the Philippines. Um, China is a big trading partner. The same is true in Australia. The same is true in New Zealand. Um, it would be a big topic to um, deal with how that plays out in Manila. But how specifically does um, the CPP figure in all of this? Where do the, the stars, the Maoists line up? That's a fascinating, fascinating development because of course the party originates out of the political line of Beijing. Uh, at a very specific point, one of the things that I attempt to establish in detail in my dissertation is that there's Maoism and there's Maoism. Maoism goes through phases. In the end, the continuity of Maoism is that it is a specific variant of Stalinism under specific historical conditions. It is Stalinism with Chinese characteristics, as it were. And the specific variant of Maoism that was implemented in the Philippines was from 1965 to 1971. It was the Lin Biao phase, protracted people's war, armed struggle in the countryside of the world. Thus, you might think that there would be deep going ties between the CPP and China, but those ties were severed by Mao himself in the 1970s when he established ties with Nixon and Kissinger, opened ties with US imperialism and embraced Marcos and Pinochet uh, because these dictatorships served the foreign policy interests of Beijing. The party was, the CPP, was fundamentally isolated. And while they attempted to maintain ties with China, they, for example, endorsed the crushing of Tiananmen uh, and said that this was a crushing of revisionism as the tanks rolled down on students and workers. The Communist Party of the Philippines saw this as a good thing. Nonetheless, their ties with China fundamentally were severed. And with the restoration of capitalism in China, uh, they had no accounting for why this occurred. Things fundamentally changed, however, in a marked fashion because things fundamentally changed in the bourgeoisie in the capitalist class in the Philippines. And the CPP is fundamentally engaged in an act of allying with them and tail ending them. And with the rise of China as an economic power and with the inability to any longer balance between Washington and Beijing, because Washington was pushing its pivot, which effectively turned tensions in the South China Sea into a flashpoint for global war, you couldn't ally with both. And thus a certain section of the Philippine elite sought ties with China at the expense of ties with Washington. And when they tied themselves to Duterte, they, they represented this for a brief moment. But in the end, and this is truly extraordinary for a party whose mantra has long included the denunciation of US imperialism, they have allied themselves with the interests of Washington. In the name of nationalism, they have taken up the, the rhetoric of furiously denouncing Chinese imperialism and doing so in a particularly vicious fashion in a fashion that targets not just China, but Chinese Filipinos as well. They have staged protests in front of the Chinese consulate, in front of the Chinese embassy, denouncing Chinese imperialism, as they refer to it, uh, and at the same time, attempting to channel the anger of the social crisis in the Philippines to hostility against Chinese Filipinos. There was a rally staged in 2015 uh, around the decision in The Hague uh, in, in the interests of Manila's case in the South China Sea, in which the head of the party's peasant wing, or the peasant wing of the front organizations, declared that the Chinese controlled the Philippine economy, 
He said they controlled the Sari Sari stores, the corner stores, the panaderia, the bake shops, that they controlled the barber shops. Now, anyone familiar with the face of Southeast Asia knows what he's in reference to. He's in reference to the micro businesses that are owned and operated by small, deeply impoverished individuals who exploit themselves from five in the morning until nine at night, attempting to feed their families. And many of these are in fact owned by Chinese Filipinos who by dint of reactionary laws in the country have been very deeply challenged to be ever become citizens. And Joma Sison issued a statement saying that anyone who opposed China, all that they needed was a can of petrol, a box of matches and a revolutionary will. That's a call for pogroms. There was a statement issued by one of the leaders of the party's front organizations, quote, this was in the mainstream press, hate China, then join the people's army and take up the struggle for national democracy. So I think the party has attempted to channel social outrage against Chinese Filipinos and against China in service to an interest of the section of the bourgeoisie that is allied with Washington. They will furiously deny this, but this is indeed their objective role. I, th I think that's, very interesting because, of course, as you're undoubtedly well aware, I mean, anti-Chinese pogroms and the vilification of Chinese businessmen, you know, is stock standard nationalism, not just in the Philippines, um, but throughout much of Asia, certainly in Indonesia um, and in other areas as well. And it does point to the fact that you know, the CPP is, is very much mired in nationalism. You know, that's its orientation. Look, I just want to turn to perhaps some of the more theoretical questions which are bound up with this. I mean, you've obviously been in, influenced in your work by the writings of Leon Trotsky. Um, perhaps you could explain um, what, what drew you towards that study. I am excited to answer this question because one of the things, the ways in which Sison has repeatedly denounced me is as a Trotskyite. And then others are confused because uh, is this a false denunciation? It is a real denunciation. My writing clearly does cite Trotsky. On a personal note, attempting to account for the poverty and not just the poverty, but the extraordinary level of wealth, the mass inequality that I encountered in my childhood, wanting to account for it, I was drawn to the writings of Marx. I was working as a bank teller making minimum wage and uh, got my hands on a copy of Marx's Capital. Read it from cover to cover on my break. Day in and day out, I would give money to people over the counter and then I would read Capital. It was eye-opening. And I found that I was convinced that I believed Marx's analysis was right. But then I looked at the history of the 20th century and I'd read enough of Marx to know that what I saw in the 1930s in the Soviet Union, for example, was not Marxism. Now there had to be an alternative to that. And that was why I found the writings of Trotsky compelling, because he was articulating what I thought was, what I still believe is, a Marxist alternative to Stalinism, what Marx and Engels would actually have written at the time. And this was very useful for me as a scholar. Every scholar needs a theoretical lens that can help them to understand the past. And I was engaged in the trenchant critique of the leadership of the Communist Party, but I was determined that I would not be criticizing them from an anti-communist bent. This was not the nature of my scholarship. But I couldn't simply dream up an alternative. This is not, this is not in the end a scholarly method. This is a sort of a dilettantism. I can't just sort of invent what should have happened. I needed to look back into the past and find a legitimate alternative to Stalinism. And there was only one the legitimate alternative to Stalinism in the course of the 20th century was Trotskyism. And thus, through a very natural and logical process, I turned in my scholarship to, well, what was a Trotskyist alternative to the policies adopted by the CPP? And how does that help us to understand their politics? And I think that it gave a great deal, both of historical weight to my work, and in the end, it gave it a coherence. Now, Thus, Trotsky is a central figure in my argument. Why then, what, what is at stake in Sison's denunciation of me as a Trotskyite? There's something fundamentally different. He's not using the term Trotskyist as a unit of analysis. He uses it as something of a political swear word. A, he throws it around without regard for its meaning. 
He uses it against rival figures in the CPP during times of split. They're Stalinists, but he denounces them as Trotskyites. He turns on liberal scholars, scholars who are not organizing the overthrow of capitalism in any way, nor are they engaged in the critique of capitalism. And he calls them Trotskyites. Sometimes he, he complicates matters by calling them crypto Trotskyites. He calls anarchists Trotskyites. Trotskyite is nothing but a swear word for him, not a unit of analysis. Now, this isn't simply that he's muddying the waters, although that's true. It also is a threat. Stalinists have throughout their history used the word Trotskyite against opponents whom they intend to murder. And the history of the 1930s in the Soviet Union, in China, in Vietnam, and elsewhere bears this out in space. The history of the 1960s and 70s as well. When a Stalinist calls you a Trotskyite, watch your back. Well, just on that note, really, I mean, uh, as you say, he uses incredibly threatening language towards you in these um, interviews, very abusive language. At the same time, one of the things he accuses you of is um, what's known as red tagging. Uh, and uh, as um, Peter quoted at the beginning of, um, you know, acting as a, as a wild informer for the um, Duterte regime. I wonder if you could um, explain what this means uh, in the context of the Philippines um, and, uh, you know, how this accusation against you is, is being used as, uh, and uh, how it's been used against others. I'd be happy to. I think this is one of the more critical questions in the Philippines today. People want an answer to this particular question. What is red tagging? Let's be clear. Red tagging is a very real thing with a long and bloody history. Uh, the Philippines was the testing ground in some ways for McCarthyism. The House Committee on Unphilippine Activities and then the Committee on Anti-Philippine Activities, because communism is not only un-American, it's un-Filipino, uh, it was a very real thing. And red tagging was a question of saying, well, this activist, this student leader, and so on and so forth, you don't know it, but they're secretly a communist. And to be a communist was a criminal offense. You could be imprisoned for years. To be a communist leader could see you subjected to the death penalty. And thus, red tagging was a right-wing strategy of attempting to dismiss political opposition, employing the reactionary criminalization of the Communist Party as a means of dismissing them imprisoning them, persecuting them, or simply threatening them enough that they were terrified into keeping silent. So red tagging is a very real thing. But at the same time, the way in which CSUN has used it repeatedly is not in service to the defense of young people, activists and workers, but to hide his own political culpability. The allegation of red tagging is used to hide what is a most transparent political reality. That the National Democratic Movement follows a common political line with the CPP. Now I have explicitly stated, I do not know, nor do I care who is or is not a member of the Communist Party. And if I did know, I would not disclose it. But at the same time, it is the worst kept secret in Philippine political history that these organizations share a common political line with the CPP. That political line is an orientation, the progressive section of the capitalist class, and then alliance with them. And they always wind up allying with the same people. Everyone knows this. And no one is protected by denouncing someone for red tagging who brings this to the fore. It's not as if the Philippine military was ignoring these activists and then they read my thousand page doctoral dissertation and they say, oh my God, they follow a common political line. And then they begin persecuting activists. To make the claim is absurd. No, what is engaged in this is to hide the fact that the party is behind every single one of these rotten alliances. And it's impossible to speak of it because you're told that to speak of the fact that the party supported Duterte endangers activists. And I'm one of the very first people to stare this down and say, no, I am not engaged in red tagging. I am intent on exposing the historical role played by the party. And what is more, my scholarship is not endangering activists, it is protecting them by documenting the history of the role that you played. And the figure that is most responsible for endangering the activists outside of the state and the military itself is Joma Sison and the leadership of the CPP who endorsed and supported Rodrigo Duterte, made possible his rise to power and the criminal attacks that he is currently carrying out. I think the, the fact that you're standing up and you know, saying 
um, and pointing this out, um, I, I think is something which has captured the notice of young people in the Philippines, um, workers in the Philippines, and also beyond. I mean, Stalinism has had its impact in many places around the world. I think one of the, the most interesting aspects of your lecture was the wealth of questions that came in. Um, and I did have the opportunity to have a look through them. Um, one of the things that stood out for me is, particularly amongst young people, um, there seemed to be a thirst for an alternative. Many of the questions were, what, it, or what is, okay, you've, you've exposed the role of the CPP. We sort of knew this in, at least in outline, but what's the alternative? How, how would you answer that? The alternative isn't something that we simply draw out of our imagination, right? It is, it has to be grounded in reality. It has to be grounded in history. And in some ways, the history of the CPP documents what the alternative is. By careful studying the history of the CPP, we begin to get a sense of the alternative. I would prognosticate that the alternative, I would argue that the alternative constitutes an opposition to certain lines put forward by the CPP. The CPP is a program of nationalism. To its core, all of the various organizations of the national democratic movement in some way or other adopt the slogan Bayan, nation, and are bent on carrying out a national revolution on nationalist grounds. No one denies this. This is a remarkable thing. The Filipino working class, more I think than any working class in the world, is an international working class. Everyone is connected around the globe to oil workers, construction workers, cruise ship liners, nurses, and so on, intimately connected by social media. Their interests are international and not national in character. And thus, I think the first step in the alternative has to be an international perspective. Again, drawing on what the CPP itself has put forward, their program has always been one of an alliance with a section of the capitalist class. And rather than simply dismiss that on theoretical grounds, saying, well, I disagree with that in a visceral way, I think the record of history is sufficient for such a dismissal. Look at it. We have a hundred years of evidence. Has there ever been a section of the capitalist class in the Philippines hailed by the CPP as the progressive section or before them the PKP, who in any way even moved beyond gesturing to any of the measures that comprise the National Democratic Revolution? Are we really to believe that these capitalists who are themselves the sugar barons are going to carry out land reform? I think it's well past time that someone began advocating that workers have their own independent interests and that those independent interests require a party of workers that is not allied with capitalists, but that fights for workers' interests. And finally, they don't start from scratch. They start, they're building on the history of the Philippines, but they're also building, I think, on the international workers' movement. And an international workers' movement requires its own program. And here, I do think that the alternative to Stalinism, Trotskyism, is worth examining. I think careful study of this alternative will, will repay in, in dividends that are extraordinary. Filipino workers who are looking for something new, something different, something that has not yet been tried. Well, I think that certainly meets up with our perspective, which is very much based on the perspective of Trotskyism um, and the theory of permanent revolution, which you know, stands in opposition to the nationalism of the um, CPP and, and Stalinism and Maoism everywhere, um, stands for the ind political independence of the working class um, and puts forward a, an internationalist um, perspective. I mean, that's at the very core, you know, of uh, our movement, the International Committee of the Fourth International and of the, the Trotskyist movement internationally. Um, one, one aspect, uh, I think, which always comes up um, in the Philippines, there is a substantial peasantry. Um, the um, orientation of the Stalinist 
in the Philippines has been to the national bourgeoisie, but also, um, and this is a constant criticism that is made, is one of the lies of Stalinism that somehow the Trotskyists underestimate the peasantry. Um, their orientation is to the armed struggle. Um, that's, that's their sort of catchphrase and one can point to the disasters this has created around the world. What, what is your understanding of the armed struggle in, in, in the Philippines carried out by the NPA? Um, and how do you see the role of the peasantry uh, in relationship to the necessary socialist revolution that has to be carried out there? The armed struggle in the Philippines has been ongoing since 1969, a very long time. And over the course of that period, it has played a number of social roles, not one. It is a complicated phenomenon. And I can't do justice to all of it, but let me touch on a few points. One, it has served as an outlet for some of the best layers of generations, young people in particular, who, as I was, were profoundly affected by the poverty, inequality, and injustice of society, and were willing to sacrifice their entire life, their future, to fight it. Now, the party instructed them that the way to do that was by taking up arms in the countryside, and a good many of them died. And thus, it has served, while never coming even close to something that would resemble seizing power, it has served as something of a social outlet for mass opposition and for an emerging leadership of mass opposition, which have been diffused across the countryside, sequestered into the Sierra Madres and into the byways of Bicol, uh, where in the end, despite the best of all possible intentions, they wind up squandering their talent and their commitment into nothing. The armed struggle has diffused social tensions over the course of years. It has not brought the working class close to the seizure of power. It has also, however, played more sordid roles than simply being an outlet for some of the best layers of generations and also the unrest of the peasantry in the countryside. It has also served to protect the interests of capitalists in the countryside, very explicitly. Programmatic statements by the party that they will protect the interests of capitalists but they bear it with the barrel of a gun. It has allied itself with some of the more brutal gold mining interests in Mindanao, with logging interests in Northern Luzon, something that I think environmentalists who are drawn to the party should be aware of. And thus it has served, while being an armed struggle, as a protective wing of capital in the countryside. It has not however, brought the working class close to the seizure of power. What is the role of the peasantry more generally and what is the function of the armed struggle? I can only touch on this briefly, but I'd like to bring to light what Marx himself had to say about this, which is that the peasantry uh, is not a class with an intrinsic single interest. It is a small landholding class on the one hand, and that has many of them, a great deal of interest in the protection of those landholding interests. It is diffused across the countryside. It does not constitute itself into a single uh, cohesive unit, it must be brought together. And finally, it is a deeply impoverished and oppressed class. And thus it has certain aspects of its character that draw it to the capitalist class, the defense and expansion of property holdings, the desire for property. And land reform is in many ways an appeal to this. And on the other hand, an alliance with the working class, from, whom's, from whose ranks it is drawn. He, the working class in the Philippines is drawn from the peasantry. Many of them are removed from the land by one generation or less, and they are all deeply oppressed. The question thus is what social force will lead the peasantry? And this was Marx's analysis. He wrote about it in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte and elsewhere. Trotsky took up this analysis and argued that the fundamental question therefore wasn't what the peasantry would do on its own, its own armed struggle and so on, but what social force would lead it. Either the capitalist class, by appealing to its conservative nature, property ownership, et cetera, 
or the working class by putting forward a program of socialist revolution. And this was the perspective of Trotsky, it was the perspective of Marx before him. And the Communist Party has, through its alliance with the capitalist class and its appeal to figures like Cory Aquino, one of the largest sugar owners in the country for land reform, has in fact, over the course of decades, cultivated the most conservative aspects of the peasant nature, hiding this behind the barrel of a gun and an armed struggle. But it has not cultivated a struggle for socialism in the working class. It has deadened that and said it is not yet time for socialism. And it has thus appealed to the conservative aspects of the peasantry. And one of the most striking features of the rise of Ferdinand Marcos was how the mass peasant organization of the PKP, Masaka, was the first social force won to the dictatorship. The party had, over the course of a decade, cultivated a mass social base for supporting authoritarianism by telling it to appeal to the executive branch for land reform, for reign from on high. The CPP, despite its rhetoric of armed struggle, has done the same. And you asked about an alternative earlier. I think this is another aspect of that. That is to say, winning over the peasantry on the basis of an appeal for socialism. Well, thank you very much. I, we are running out of time. I'm sure Tom feels, as I do, that there are many other questions that we could ask. Can I just, just finish with one? Um, I mean, clearly your lecture, uh, as is indicated by the response of um, Cizon, has dealt a, a significant political blow to the CPP in the Philippines. Um, does this have broader significance um, elsewhere in Asia and beyond? I think every scholar would like to think that the answer to that question is yes. And so with out a sense of false modesty, and yet aware that maybe I don't want to bring too much credit to my own work. It's not so much my scholarship as the fundamental questions that it raises, the question of Stalinism and the betrayals that it carried out. This does have profound implications throughout the region. And the CPP in particular, which has been held up as sort of the last man standing, as it were, in the, in the fight for communism and so on. And there are social forces throughout the region, various left organizations around the world that have, in the name of thinking globally and acting locally, have hailed the CPP while they themselves sort of endorse kinder, gentler capitalism at home. And I think the discrediting of the CPP is a blow to a great many of these forces. And to the extent that my scholarship becomes more widely known and other similar scholars in other fields, I hope, bring similar things to light, I think that it will have something of a domino effect, a ripple effect, a broad shift in left circles around the globe uh, as an awareness of the complicity in the rise of Duterte, the human rights violations, and so on, that this particular Stalinist party was guilty of expose in a similar fashion, similar machinations that have been carried out in other countries, all in the end of the detriment of the international working class. Look, just in closing, I, I think, um, look, there are a number of young people and others who've, who've commented on your lecture. They've expressed their gratitude for detailing the historical truth about the role of the CPP and Maoism in the Philippines and also commended you for your courage. And we would do the same and encourage our readers and supporters um, to write statements of support for you. Uh, I think this is particularly important given the slanders and the, as you say yourself, the implied threats uh, that, are, that are contained in the attack by you, on you by Cizon and the CP. Um, Look, just in, finally, in, in, in closing, I think you have pointed, you know, to the real alternative, which, uh, to Stalinism, which lies in Leon Trotsky. And I think for young people and workers in the Philippines who are looking for a revolutionary alternative to the CPP, that can be found in the works of Leon Trotsky. The la as you said yourself, the label Trotskyite has been used by Cizon and the CPP as a swear word to brand their critics and opponents. And in doing so, they've created a great deal of political confusion. I would just urge 
young people who were looking for an alternative, a revolutionary alternative, to make a serious study of the works of Leon Trotsky, but also to examine the political record of our movement, the International Committee of the Fourth International, because we alone have defended these principles, that is the principles of Trotskyism, which is contemporary Marxism. And we've done so not only against Stalinism, but the various varieties of pseudo left tendencies that have repudiated those principles. So I would encourage those who are watching this interview, if you're not already doing so, to read the World Socialist website, to contact us, and to begin a political discussion on these issues. Thank you very much, Joseph, and uh, we'll finish there.